It's the Security Weekly News. It's episode 405. I'm starting to feel the weight of the years. Uh, it is Friday the 9th of August, 2024. We've got 0.0.0.0, Black Suit, OpenAI, AWS, Cisco Phones, Win10, Aaron Leyland, and more on the Security Weekly News. This is a Security Weekly production for security professionals by security professionals. Please visit securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe to subscribe to all the shows on our network. We interrupt our program to bring you this important It's the show that keeps you up to date on the latest security news twice a week. Your trusted source for accurate security information and expert analysis. It's time for the Security Weekly News. ThreatLocker implements a least privileged approach to cybersecurity, blocking every executable unless specifically authorized by your team. This methodology mitigates ransomware, supply chain attacks, zero-day exploits, and ensures 24-7, 365 and a quarter protection for your organization. To learn more about how ThreatLocker can help prevent known and unknown threats in your digital environment, safeguard your data and operations from threat actors, and align your organization with respected compliance frameworks, Visit securityweekly.com slash threatlocker. Hi, folks. I'm Adrian Sanabria, the host of Enterprise Security Weekly. Every week, we interview the most interesting folks we can find talking about the most pressing cybersecurity issues and challenges facing the enterprise today. Myself and my co-hosts have each been in the industry for decades, long enough to see the patterns in the industry and explore where trends are going. In addition to enterprise challenges, we also follow the vendor space, the most interesting security startups emerging, technology and product trends, all of the most interesting funding and acquisition announcements. Finally, we love to discuss the latest trends in tech and how they'll impact cybersecurity. If you're wondering how the latest in AI, quantum computing, cloud, and DevOps is going to impact security a few years down the road, you should follow the Enterprise Security Weekly Podcast. All right, from the island of Elba, it's the Security Weekly News. I'm Doug White. Be sure and hit that like and subscribe button and leave us a comment or, I don't know, you'll lose your job. I, I mean, you know, there was a woman last week who didn't hit the like, subscribe, and comment, and, you know, bad things happen. And another person hit the like, subscribe, and comment, and they won the lottery the next day. So what's not the like? All right, Sissa. A, a person from CISA told me to say it that way, not Paul. It was an actual person at CISA. I always said CISA, but, you know, whatever. Who knows how to pronounce acronyms? CISA and the FBI confirmed that Royal Ransomware, which has been rebranded as Black Suit, uh, has demanded more than 500 million U.S. dollars from victims since it emerged more than two years ago. Uh, the Black Suit gang uh, has been uh, active since September of 2022 in various forms. Uh, maybe. Uh, and they believe that this is a fork of Conti, the Conti syndicate, syndicate and Conti ransomware, which has been around for a long time. Uh, and of course, that was, you know, they, they sort of changed over back in January of 2022. Now, the original group started out, they were using other people's encryptors, they used all kinds of things, but they developed their own encryptor called Xeon. And then they quickly rebranded that to Royal. I guess they hired a marketing company who went, Xeon, that's a processor. Call yourself Royal. That tested really well. Uh, but that happened in September of 2022. But then in June of 2023, a new encryptor that they called Black Suit was revealed. And that group's been operating ever since. Now, Royal seems to right around that same time have ceased to exist. So the suspicion in this you know, claim is that Conti became Royal became black suit and black suit ransoms are typically from 1 million to 10 million U S dollars in Bitcoin. But the largest one they've made so far was 60 million U S dollars. CISA and the FBI have linked the black suit group to uh, attacks against over 350 organizations since September of 2022. And this report says that the group may have been behind the CDK global outage that shut down about 15,000 U.S. car dealerships last month when their back-end software all got ransomware. Uh, the point is not that ransomware exists, not that Black Suit is anything different than any other of the other dozen ransomware gangs. But the point is there's always going to be a new gang. 
and a new product and a new angle and a new encryptor trying to get you. And you will probably eventually get got. Uh, so have a plan. Test the plan. Don't just do one of those tests where we go, did our plan work? Yes, it did. You need to physically test it. Can you actually get back online? And also, what are you going to do when they're releasing your data, when they exfiltrate all your information and they threaten to release it? Are you going to pay them? If you're going to pay them, are you going to come up with the money? And so on and so on and so on. Do that while you have plenty of time to sit. I know you don't have plenty of time, but you know, while you're not running around with your hair on fire kind of time. Um, I know you're always running around with your hair on fire, but find the time. Uh, I'm just going to warn you about this one again. I get a lot of contacts uh, pretty regularly by, uh, well, girls in bikinis, which I know has got to be fake. Uh, people wanting work, offering to work for me for very low wages and also offering to hire me for very high wages. Now, I know I'm probably missing out by not returning that call to that person who said they would pay me $500 an hour. Um, but, you know, but anyway, the U.S. Justice Department arrested a, a person in Nashville, Tennessee, uh, and charged them with helping North Korean IT workers obtain remote work at companies across the U.S. and operating a laptop farm that they use to pose as U.S. based individuals. This person's name is Matthew Isaac Canute, and they helped North Koreans pose as a, as a person named Andrew M., who is a U.S. citizen, apparently. And basically what they did was they provided housing for the company provided laptops. So I, you've probably hired remote workers and supervised these processes. But, you know, when you get hired as a remote worker, if you've never done this, the company usually supplies you with a laptop. They send it to you in, you know, FedEx or UPS or something. And you set it up at your house and you connect to their VPN and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, do all your credentials. This one, they're sending the laptops to Nashville, Tennessee. And Mr. Canute uh, helps them get these set up. And so basically what they were doing was they're laundering money uh, from the companies to, to who paid Andrew M., who I guess is a fake person who cashed the checks, and then they transfer the money to North Korea. Um, yeah, and also China. But basically the fake people applied for the jobs. They had the laptop sent down there to Nashville. They logged, and then, then Mr. Canute logged into the laptop, installed some kind of remote desktop app, which was a violation of policy, of course, and then allowed the Chinese and North Korean IT workers to remotely connect to the company networks uh, via the laptop that's sitting in Nashville. So the North Korean IT workers were generating revenue for the North Korean nuclear weapons program and apparently were each paid over $250,000 between July 2022 and August 2023. Um, wow. Uh, this was the second set of charges in a case like this recently. Christina Marie Chapman was charged for the very same thing in Arizona. So there's probably more of this going on. So you may really want to review who you are hiring make sure they're legit somehow and make sure they're accessing the system. And, and I would say, you know, sweep these remote laptops and make sure they've not got log me in and other tools installed on them so they can, they can, uh, you know, get into your network and they, you know, they may be working for you legitimately and transferring the money to North Korea, or they may actually dump a bunch of malware on you. Mandy and said, quote, based on the volume and scale of activity we've seen, North Korean IT workers are widespread in Fortune 500 companies, and they're using their earnings to incentivize others and to aid their operations. I mean, honestly, if companies are paying remote IT workers $250,000 a year and they need a fine U.S. American citizen with a passport, hey, call me. I, I could use a pay raise. That that sounds pretty appealing. I can work from home at two fifty a year. That that's that's yeah. Call me. Um, all major browsers are apparently plagued with a vulnerability called the zero 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 dot zero dot zero day. <laughs> a sort of unwieldy name, but a lot of us networking people are used to saying things like that. Uh, it apparently can allow an attacker to send a malicious request to the local network and could lead to remote code execution. Oligo, Oligo security discloses on Wednesday. So apparently you can send a single HTTP post request that's been crafted to 0 .0 0.0.0.0. Okay. And then that the browser redirects this to 127.0.0.1 local host. Huh? 
Interesting. Now, you're probably familiar with localhost, and localhost, of course, can act as a demon and 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 hear things and and connect and do all kinds of tricks. But it was designed to be done locally, right? So that's not really supposed to happen, but it does. And if that redirect happens and something gets sent to localhost, and that localhost, which is your desktop, may respond to it. Uh, Firefox, Safari, Chrome, and Edge, and uh, uh, any other Chromium-based browsers are all affected by this flaw, which was reported back in April of 2024 to the manufacturers. All the companies immediately started moving toward blocking 0.0.0.0 since then, but it's not fully blocked yet. Of course, all of us networking people cringe when we see zero addresses because we remember the days when all your equipment would crash if somebody sent a zero-based address through the even if it was like 192.168.1.0 192.168.1.0 would crash a lot of networking equipment. But this 0000 is sort of the you know holy grail of bad addresses, uh, although it's a legitimate address, don't get me wrong. Uh, Chromium 133 apparently will be the first version of the Chromium engine that will fully block this. They have some mitigations in place apparently now. Uh, Safari and other iOS browsers have moved to fully block it, and Firefox said it was in progress. So this is sort of a problem. Uh, You may want to put this in your web monitoring so that if you see traffic coming in, because you should not have public traffic coming into your network that has a destination of 0000 for any reason that I can imagine. Black Hat, which is going on this week, disclosed six critical vulnerabilities in Amazon Web Services. Aqua Security Nautilus Research Team presented the vulnerabilities in a session called Breaching AWS Accounts Through Shadow Resources. Now, if I had a sponsor who sent me to Black Hat, hint, hint, I would have been there and heard it directly, but nobody did. So here I am. But apparently, uh, the way this works is it involves the generation of automatic S3 buckets. So this is how a lot of these tools that are in the cloud work. So S3 is, of course, Amazon's storage site. And buckets are basically directories, I guess, uh, would be an equivalent to that. And they have permissions and so forth and so on. Uh, so this thing included cloud formation, glue, EMR, SageMaker, service catalog, and CodeStar, and may include other things as well. But this initial report was those. Now, you may not see this happening, but what happens is when a project starts, when you create a new project or a new instance in a cloud-based tool, these buckets get created in storage, and the names of the buckets are predictable. Oh, and if something's predictable, that means someone can predict them. And once they predict them, that means they can try to exploit them. Remember when you could guess network sequence numbers and you could like do actual person in the middle attacks on people because you could guess their sequence numbers and inject traffic? Yeah, Pepperidge Farm remembers. But this was first discovered in cloud formation and and then five more critical problems were found. And what they found was that, that if a bucket had already been created with a predicted name by somebody else, when cloud formation tried to upload the template file that you were asking to be created, it was placed in the bucket that already existed. Ooh. And of course, if the attacker created that bucket, they now had your stuff. And so this turned into an attack that's called a bucket monopoly attack, which I had not heard of. So I had to look, I, I could kind of guess what it was, but basically someone tries to figure out the names of all possible buckets in in the region where you're operating and then they basically go out and create all those buckets so they've scripted in they create thousands of buckets probably and that way whatever happens any new bucket for you ends up being a bad bucket that your stuff gets put in and then they can get it now this was fixed in june after the initial report to amazon in february but it really is an interesting uh, when they release a black hat presentations if you use a lot of this you may want to go look, look at it but it really underscores the issues with any kind of storage that you don't completely understand or control. I mean, can you remember CH mod seven, seven, seven star Chepridge farm remembers. I mean, you don't even know how many times I saw that world writable stuff on people's web servers. You know, they, it wasn't just their tree. They just literally made the whole server world writable and, you know, people were extracting their password files or shadow files, writing stuff. I mean, one of the early, you know, this guy said they got hacked by some Uber hacker because they had overwritten their main web page. And I was like, dude, you realize you have 777 on all your files? And he was like, I don't even know what that means. And I'm just like, oh, my God. Yeah. 
you know, and the, the web server's got the email server, the video camera server, the financial server, other databases. Yeah, everything. Directory ter- traversal, anyone? Yeah. Film at 11. Check out your risk of this. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. Now, you know, I've always worried about automatic updates. I sit here worrying. I can't sleep at night because I'm worried about, you know, what's Microsoft doing to my servers? But I mean, they always make me nervous, right? Because they're, they, they're always, you know, doing something. They're, they're going to push an update. They're going to reboot my server in the middle of the night. They used to do this all the time. And I always go in and turn them off on my servers. And I know something, 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 security, something, something, and lack of update, something, something. But I still worry about what they're pushing out. And, you know, and, and of course, this whole thing with uh, cloud with CrowdStrike, you know, sort of reiterates this. But, hey, you know, when they tell me to reboot and update, I reboot and update. I live to serve, almighty oh, one. But Safe Breach Lab said that there's an urgent attention needed on Windows Update. And this is due to the ability of an attacker to launch what they called a software downgrade attack. And again, I wasn't really clear on what that meant. And again, I could guess, but I went and looked it up. Um, <coughs> basically, uh, this was also a Black Hat presentation where I am not. But according to the presentation, quote, I was able to make a fully patched Windows machine susceptible to thousands of past vulnerabilities, turning fixed vulnerabilities into zero days. <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess that's what a downgrade attack really is, right? And basically what they did was they manipulated the XML file, which is... Uh, which is managing updates and they pushed a tool in called windows down date, which then let them bypass all the verification steps for upgrades. So they basically reversed the upgrades. Yeah. So they roll you back to windows NT 4.0 patch level, or I don't know, all the way back to Southwest airlines, but the issues are reported to Microsoft in February of this year, and they have still not been fixed. Uh, they said that a, a security update will soon migrate, mitigate the threat. Uh, on Wednesday of this week, CVEs were published for all uh, for both of these, and they had two advisories and some current mitigations. They were pretty severe, so security updates are, are you know are not currently available for this. So if you know you may want to consider, could this be pushed to you? How do you trust updates? Do you have restrictions on your machine's ability to talk to somebody besides Microsoft? And, and you know, I mean, I don't know. You think about it. Cisco phones are everywhere, and if you've been in an office in the last 10 years that didn't have a VOIP phone somewhere, you know, you probably just weren't looking hard enough. I mean, I think there's like someone buried under one of the piles of junk that's buried under another pile of junk on my desk. And by the way, if anybody wants to donate a new building for my program, uh, you know, call me again because I, I could use a new office that has all my lab stuff in it. British defense contractor BAE found three critical flaws in the small business SPA 300 and SPA 500 models, and none of these are going to be updated. And they're not going to leave your desk anytime soon. These things are all over the place. All these three flaws are rated 9.8 on the CVSS score meter, and they affect, wait for it, the web-based management interface of the devices, as ever. And basically, somebody can get root and they can hijack the phones. Now, Cisco said they were not going to fix this, and that these are end of life. So, you know, a handy-dandy way to say, please upgrade or get rid of them and let people just use cell phones. But, you know, so much like that old rotary phone that's still hanging on the wall of your server room out in Four Corners, Texas, that actually still has a dial tone, <laughs> these things are sitting somewhere as well. Support and fixes for these ended in 2020, but they are phones. How old is the phone on your desk right now? I mean, if you actually have a landline phone. When it was an old rotary phone, well, somebody had to come in there to mess with it. But VOIP, especially if you've got VOIP running on the same VLAN as your network, naughty, naughty, uh, you know, be careful. So do an inventory check and send these things to the junk heap. I mean, I don't know that you need to replace them, but maybe you do. I don't, I don't know. And speaking of de- disappearing into the West, Windows 10 is sailing to that distant horizon as well. They're, L. Ron and them are boarding the boats as we speak. Windows 10, which was ironically released in 2015, which says something about it, is starting to stroll down that long blue tunnel to the afterlife. RIP, Kurt. But on 14 October 2025, public support for Windows 10 will end, which means no more software updates, no more patches, no more security, no more support, nothing. 
Now, it'll still work, right? I mean, you don't have to panic and say, oh, my God, our whole company is going to shut down because we're running Windows 10. Just like, you know, Windows 95 will still run. That doesn't mean they've updated it in a long time, but it will still run, Southwest Airlines. But uh, everything is still going to keep working. But this is a good time to start your budgetary planning for fixing this because, see, not everything can upgrade to Windows 11. The update's actually free. Uh, you can update your machine. Now, this desktop that I'm recording this on, you know, I just said, yeah, let's update. What the hell? Uh, we update it. But a lot of laptops won't run Windows 11. The hardware will not support it. It requires a different processor. So if you're interested in that, there's a lot of discussions about it. And I have a whole pile of laptops that are just basically going to become much higher quality Linux laptop when that happens because they will not run Windows 11. But if you do need a Windows machine for work or even a desktop machine, you may want to start thinking about what are you going to do a year from now? Because that way, when some new critical issue comes up, there will be no update. Won't stop working, but just like Southwest Airlines running a PDP-7 or an Apple IIe or whatever it is they use, you will not have much in the way of updates or support. So there you go. Uh, and also not sponsored for attendance at Black Hat besides DEF CON and what, with him being banned from Fremont Street for that incident with the Panther and the Gen, it is Aaron Leyland. Hi, Aaron. Are we like the only people, Dr. Doug, that aren't in Vegas right now? Yeah, we are, literally. And and we're like the most fun people to be in Vegas. I know. Vegas should have I mean, sponsored us to go to Vegas. I know. I mean, we're the life of every party, especially you. Well, I just stand there and look pretty while you entertain, but <laughs> no, but that's when we're trying to get money after we've spent it all gambling. That's a completely <laughs> different story. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> Before I get us in trouble and off the air and um, <laughs> knock my earphone out, my really expensive earphone, these cost me 99p at our equivalent of the dollar store, but they work. <laughs> Okay, today I have an article by Alex Scroxton, the security editor at computerweekly.com. Good work over there. Um, link in the show notes. All you need to do for the show notes is Google Security Weekly News, and it's there under SC Media. Small rant. <laughs> I started ranting to myself this morning when I was writing this. So anyway, watch out for some other organization that looks like they pay a ton of money to Google to be above us in the search list. Because <laughs> they definitely come first. But in my personal opinion, if you have to pay money to Google to try and entice people away by appearing above them when you Google the actual name, <laughs> then you should probably swerve that company, okay? But anyway, Google taking over the world is normal. Just remember who coined the phrase, don't be evil. Yeah, it was Google, wasn't it? <laughs> what happened then? Anyway, that made me laugh. <laughs> Rant over. Okay, world's largest companies at near universal risk of supply chain breach. It's like, ah, security scorecards data continues to highlight the interdependence of business supply chains and the threats, unexpected IT issues and cyber risks. See, solar winds and CrowdStrike all in one sentence pose to the operational community. Right, th this, is, this is pretty big numbers here, as in like, this is pretty all encompassing. Among the 2,000 biggest companies worldwide, it's stated in these findings that 1,980, so they only couldn't find details on 20, are tied to a tech supplier that has encountered a security incident or data breach in the near past. I didn't look into how close that was, but I'm guessing um, <laughs> maybe as far back as solar winds, maybe. So this underscores the increasing risk to the global economy arising from cyber attacks involving multiple entities in the supply chain. It's all you're going to hear about. It's like it's it's supply chain gone mad. But hey, if I was an APT, where would I hide? Um, so in the research released to mark the opening day of the annual Black Hat Security Conference, where Doug and I are not at because I'm in London and he's on an island, Security Scorecard and the Scientia Institute said that they identified that 99% of the organizations listed on the Forbes Global 2000 list, it's like 99%, and it, there's loads of companies in here, even UK multinationals such as AstraZeneca, BP, Diageo, HSBC, and Vodafone. 
my American friends and cousins. Do you know any of them? <laughs> Maybe HSBC. I don't know. BP. They probably supply the, the the gas for your big trucks. Anyway, so losses are rising. Big numbers from breaches affecting Global 2000 are already well within the billions of dollars. They're saying possibly as high as 80 billion in the last 15 months. And the joint study found that 20% of the Global 2000 we're using 1,000 or more IT products, 1,000 or more IT products. It's like, obviously, meaning they face the same amount of um, number of potential sort of attack vectors, entry points, whatever you want to call them, but 1,000, wow, that's a lot. Okay, added to this, the significant interdependence, so it's all about interdependence, that exists between this network of organization concentrates this risk, and that, that was said by Wade Baker, Cynthia, partner and co-founder, somebody who's the names easier to say. God, you Americans have some cool names. And I'm just Aaron. <laughs> okay, while the Global 2000 boasts 51 trillion in revenue, <laughs> that's definitely not in the UK because we have a GDP of about 3 trillion. Anyway, their interconnectedness exposes them to severe cyber risks. And as we say, with 99% directly connected, directly connected to breach vendors and incidents that can tally into the tens of billions. So what they say is the world is only beginning to grasp the potential chaos caused by concentrated risk. And this is true, but you Security Weekly watchers and listeners, um, you're already well into this. So they say understanding and managing your supply chain is critical. And CrowdStrike was a warning. It's it's like, of course it was, but so was SolarWinds and so were the other ones to come. And it's just like, I don't know. It's like, have we seen the biggest one yet? No, I don't think we've seen the biggest one yet. I think it's yet to come. Okay, so what you need to do is keep abreast of your supplier's own IT deployments to identify and resolve hidden risks from their supply chains. Um, it's like, what they go on about in the article is they talk about continuous eternal attack surface monitoring. Do you do that? Do you have something like Nessus that externally scans all the time or do you just do an annual pen test? I don't know. You, you definitely want to. I guess if you're using something like WordPress, um, I would probably do continuous scanning rather than sort of um, the odd ones. But definitely here's my sort of top few or a few more. Vendor risk management, implement a robust vendor risk management process. Like if you don't have that, it's crazy. Patch management, even it, now when I go for job interviews, I talk about aggressive patching. It's very important. And if we go back to sys controls, asset inventory creation management, it's like sandbox testing and user awareness training. Why wouldn't we do that? And probably not just an annual computer pace training package. And obviously you're going to have access control policies and you're going to integrate security into DevSecOps, not just like Dev or Ops, it's DevSecOps. But yeah, that's all cool. And you're going to have end-to-end -end encryption. And of course, we don't have to warn you about multi-factor authentication. And you're going to have regular assets and audits to make sure that all works and you're not checking your own homework. But anyway, that's me for today. Back to my supplier. Yes, my supplier, Dr. Doug in the studio. Peace out, party people. Thank you, Aaron. I'm not sure what I supply, but hey, you know, if you want the it, fun, we got Doug, it. The fun. Come on down. We, whatever you need. <laughs> Bitcoins. Thanks, Aaron. All right. You're uh, OpenAI has had a system for watermarking chat GPT generated content and a tool that would detect the watermark ready for about a year, but they haven't released it because there's a debate internally about whether they should or not, according to the Wall Street Journal. Now, I mean, I personally think we are going to have to have some kind of digital watermarking that it, we're, you know, because right now we're constantly having to decide, is this real? Is it fake? Or is it somebody claiming it's fake because it is real and they don't want it to be revealed? Is it someone claiming it's real, even though it's fake because they don't want it to not have happened? You know what they, you know, I mean, that picture of me in that alley, fake news never happened. Or is it? Who knows? 
I mean, you know, that term paper on Bartleby the Scrivener, did I write it? Did I buy it for my roommate? Did I buy it from the back page of the Village Voice in 1979? Or did I have Mr. Paper write and on AI? Yeah, we are going to have to do something to validate all this. So the world is just going to be one big set of fakes where you can't really tell what's going on and you can get away with anything, right? Because you can blame it on, you know, I mean, they used to blame it on Ambien, right? I mean, you know, sir, how did you end up on the steps of the White House in this Hummer? Oh, uh, Ambien. Excellent. No problem. But today we can just say, oh, that's fake news. It was all made up by AI. But OpenAI says their detection tool is 99.9% .9 effective, which already sounds scary. I'm like, wait, what about that point one? That, that's a little worrisome. But then they went on and they said it could be manipulated with another model and so forth. And then when they went on and they said, oh, yeah, and 30% of our current customers said they wouldn't use it if it was watermarked. Oh, well, welcome to the Matrix. Anyway, if you're at Black Hat DEF CON, enjoy. If you're not, well, enjoy that too. And that is the news. Thank you, Aaron. And I will see you next time on the Security Weekly News.